Hi everyone, my name is Jeff Frankenfield. I'd like to introduce myself to you. I'm a former active duty Marine, a political science major, and I am passionate about educating people on the foundations of good government. I wanna see us as the citizens of the electorate of the United States be informed enough to make wise decisions as it pertains to public policy. Welcome to Center Lane Conversations. I'll be your host and I welcome you this Memorial Day weekend 2020, a weekend in which we honor and remember those that died on the battlefield defending our freedoms. It is our honor, privilege, and I believe our duty to walk out those freedoms that they died for. And that's what this show is about. I am passionate about the freedoms of the citizens of the United States and I want to see good government function well and us as citizens be able to prosper because of that. Some of us are moderates. Um, we may be left of center in some regards, maybe right of center in others, uh, but it seems like right now there's a, a toxicity uh, between both sides, the left going further left, the right side pulling just as hard on the right, trying to counterbalance that, and most of us who are in the middle are left without a landing place. So I hope you'll join me as we discuss a variety of topics. Sometimes they'll be teaching, sometimes it'll be sort of like a politics 101, if you will, uh, which may be the case in this first installment. And other times we'll be talking about legislation, we'll be talking current events, we'll be talking about all sorts of things as it relates to politics. But first and foremost, at the base, I just wanna see good government. And that's what we're gonna discuss. We're gonna try and look at it from both sides and uh, see what we can come about. I do welcome your uh, thoughts. Your comments, there'll be an email address on the bottom of your screen. Please email me. That would be great feedback. Um, if you want specific topics talked about, please uh, send them in. Really, really welcome those and looking forward to diving in. So for this first episode, I want to talk to you about state constitutions. It's not a topic that I have heard talked about very much. It's come up a little bit more. We're in the midst of this COVID-19 situation, and there's a lot of dialogue going back and forth. People are getting kind of ticked off, trying to figure out what their rights are, claiming they have rights, others claiming they don't have rights. And there's a lot of confusion out there. People are claiming the U.S. constitutional rights, et cetera, and not realizing that there's state constitutions, which they fall under as well. And we want to talk about those things. I was doing some research as a, as a side note, I, I was wondering initially if there was a correlation between the, the, the length of constitution, state constitutions and how much people were taxed. Um, I, I live here in California. I was reading our constitution. It was over 400 pages long. I couldn't believe it. I, I've studied the U.S. constitution. Um, I know it well, but I, I admittedly had not walked through the California constitution ever. And uh, so once I realized how long it was, I thought, wow, this... This is amazing. This is kind of so shocking, if you will. And so I started digging more into uh, the state constitutions as a whole, and it became a really fascinating uh, subject for me to study because there is a tremendous amount of diversity, which is the power of the country. States get to have their own uh, ways of doing life. And so almost every state has their own unique constitution. And so let's talk about that, some of those things. So before we dive into the state constitutions, let's talk about the U.S. Constitution. At the federal level, it's the one everyone thinks of when they think of the Constitution. It's been around since the, the beginning of our country. It has lasted over 200 years, has not been amended very much, has not been changed very much. There's only been 27 amendments in there. And so it has withstood the test of time. And in that Constitution, it lays out the framework for government. It gives us the, the three branches of government. You have the executive, the legislative, and the judicial. And it lays out systematically what each of the roles are as new, as new laws have had to come, uh, come about for our country. Those have um, been inserted as part of amendments, etc. Now, the reason I bring that up is because the 10th Amendment essentially states that anything not written in this United States Constitution, that authority goes to the states. And that's significant because if you look at what is essentially a fairly small document, um, there's a lot of power that goes to the states. More than we think, um, we assume, again, that we walk around under the umbrella of the U.S. Constitution, which we do, which I'll get into, um, but it's really the state's constitution that can significantly affect our day-to-day -day life. Okay, before I go into all the various uh, state kind of cool facts that I, that I wanted to pass on to you, I want to address one situation that has come up this week Again, it's Memorial Day weekend 2020. We're in the midst of the COVID-19 situation. But the First Amendment rights in the dialogue, the, um, the right to assemble, the freedom of religion, et cetera, that has come up a lot this week, even with the federal government and President Trump saying, hey, governors, 
go ahead and open up uh, the church services. It is an essential service. Uh, please do that. Why can't he override the governors? Well, it, it, and here's, here's the reason. So the U.S. Constitution, as I mentioned, is the law of the land, and a state cannot put a law in place that, that oversteps the bounds of the U.S. Constitution. So if there is a debate, if they conflict with one another, whatever, the U.S. Constitution is, is the winner, and that is, again, the, the law of the land. But here's the problem. At the, at the beginning of the COVID-19 situation, as soon as um, it was um, named a pandemic or a national emergency, a health emergency by the federal government, that triggers the states to give them pol uh, police power over its citizens. And once that happens, the states can pretty much do whatever they want. And um, so it's, again, this is why we're starting this show. It's really important that, that we all have good leaders um, that are watching over us, that are, that are putting policy in place, that can handle situations in the midst of what we're having right now in a, in a wise way. So in this case, let's get back to the First Amendment rights. So each of these rights are fundamental, we know that, but the only way that those rights are kind of null and void is if uh, there is an imminent threat to the health of the public. And unfortunately, the pandemic, when it was when it was uh, when it was said to be a national emergency, a health emergency that had an imminent threat for its people, all bets were off. It triggered the police state mandate um, and the abilities of the state to pretty much do what they want, and that is why you'll see some states releasing those a little bit and allowing people to to go about their business, to to join in church services, etc. And then other states, which are still on complete lockdown. So I just wanted to address that in case you were wondering, because that's, that's something I had to de uh, dive into a little bit this week uh, for me to I was getting frustrated as well, and, uh, but, but I hope that helps. State constitutions get changed out fairly often. Um, as we know, the U.S. Constitution has been around since the beginning of our country. It's, it's served us well. It's, it's stood the test of time over 200 years, and it's only been amended 27 times. There's 27 amendments in the, in the Constitution. State uh, constitutions are much different, and I found this out initially. It's kind of what got me going on this um, this journey, if you will, for this episode. As I was reading through the Constitution, I looked up the Constitution of California, and I was shocked to see that it was over 400 pages long. I thought, what on earth is this? So I started digging in and come to find out um, a lot of states are like that. Um, but backing up, they, they do change out their, their constitution once, constitutions once in a while. Um, California here is on its second constitution. Uh, many of the Western states are still on their first, but across um, the country, I think that Louisiana is, uh, has the highest turnover rate. They're on their 11th constitution. Uh, if you're, in case you're wondering, Georgia was the last um, to change theirs out, and that was done in 1982. So now each of these constitutions are similarly structured to the U.S. Constitution. They are going to lay out the, uh, the three branches of government. So you have the executive, or what is the governor, essentially, in, at the state level. So you have the executive branch, the legislature, which is like the Congress, and then, and then your judicial branch. Um, it's also going to uh, walk through how you go about making laws in that state. And that's not uniform. Some states give a lot of the power uh, and when I say the states, I mean the, the people living in the state, the way they have drafted things up. Some states give the complete lawmaking uh, ability to the legislature. What that means is once you vote those people into office, they get a say 100% on the laws, new laws that come up. You as a citizen do not uh, get to vote on that. Okay, so now in California and other states like us, it's a little bit different. Our constitution is written differently. So I had mentioned that uh, the constitution declares how laws are made. So in, in this case, in our state here, uh, pub, the public can actually decide on what new regulations or new laws can go up for the vote. So whereas in other states, just the legislature uh, gets to decide on that. Here, we, we're still, even though we've already voted them in, we still can be uh, participative in the political process. So you'll see throughout the year, people will try and get referendums up there, they'll get legislation, laws, etc., whatever it is, changes uh, that need to occur up onto the ballot so that the next voting cycle, um, us as the electorate uh, get to cast our vote as to whether we want to see that 
um, new legislation in place, which I think it is pretty cool. Again, I'm all about the freedoms of the, the people. I want us to be able to have some say in the matter. It's one thing to, to vote people in, uh, into office, but then to kind of be um, hamstrung by by their decisions, that's just that's that's not cool. So um, let, let's let's talk about a few other things. Speaking of legislation, I found it really interesting to dive down into the state constitutions and see the diversity in the amount of legislation that actually sits in there. It's crazy to me. So at the federal level, the U.S. Constitution I had mentioned before, it's a fairly small document. There's only 27 amendments in there. It's it's not a long read. And it's, and it's very small because they're trying to keep a, a limited scope of government within, within the U.S. Constitution. The state constitution, as I've mentioned, is totally different. And the reason things are so long, I, I talked about California's constitution being over 400 pages long. The reason for that is states a lot of times put in all pieces of public policy. They actually go into the constitution. Now, if you go back and, and you look at some of this stuff, some of the laws that were in there, the public policy from 100 years ago, is still sitting in there, 150 years ago. Even if that public policy has changed, they have not amended the Constitution, they have not taken that out, so that stuff sits in there, so it just starts adding up and adding up and adding up. And what you'll see is there are some constitutions at the state level that may have as few as maybe a dozen amendments in there. But, there's, but they range, there. I think the highest one has over 900 amendments in there. So it can be pretty staggering, and uh, that is a tall task if you wanna get into the state constitutions. But again, it is recommended to at least know your rights because my rights here in California may be totally different than a place such as Texas or, or Florida or Wisconsin, et cetera. So, um, and when we're trying to talk and have dialogue nationally, about what's going on, it's, 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 it's important to understand uh, the limitations on what we each face. One other interesting fact I found uh, within the state constitutions to be aware of is that almost all of them, in fact, 49 out of 50, have some sort of specific legislation or mandate to have a balanced budget, Vermont being the only one that, that can go in a deficit like our, like our federal budget can be. But that is important because, for example, uh, there are states right now with the COVID epidemic um, that are losing a lot of money. Of course, the, the economies have shut down, et cetera. And um, they are by law not allowed to go to a deficit. So if they no longer are getting the money uh, that they were expecting to take care of social programs, et, et cetera, and that money is no longer there, then these governors start freaking out. Um, the state legislature starts freaking out. And that is why you start seeing states asking for um, a federal bailout. The federal level, they, they, they print the money. They, they can go into a deficit. It's, it's a different situation. Um, but that's, that's where it gets really interesting and the dialogue going on as far as saying, okay, there's, there's states out there. They're saying, hey, woe is us. Um, federal, you know, federal government, you're going to have to bail us out. And then the federal government is saying, hey, you, know, you mismanaged your state. Uh, don't call on us. It's, it's not our fault. It's your fault for, for behaving the way you have and putting the restrictions in that you have. Uh, deal with it. So um, again, it's this, we'll get into all of this over the coming um, weeks, hopefully, uh, but it's fascinating to me how, how different uh, these states are. Um, and lastly, okay, one final thing I'm going to talk to you about before I let you go. This is the issue of city and county rights versus the state you live in. This is something that's come up a lot, probably each of us in whatever state we're in. Uh, we may uh, be a little ticked off at the state mandates of what we can and can't do. We feel that, hey, we live in a city and a county where our situation is different. There's a, you know, that we are different than another part of the, the state and there shouldn't be just state mandated guidelines. We should be able to get out, et cetera. Or other people are like, we need to just hunker down and, and shut down and we're mad at anyone leaving, et cetera. So the question is, you as a city, uh, local government, city or county, what rights do you have if the state um, is mandating certain things on you? Well, um, the, ultimately, the city and county uh, fall under the jurisdiction of the state. So whereas the federal government and state governments are, are separated, uh, they each have their own authority in a way, um, the city and county, even though they do have their own public policy, um, the municipalities, et cetera, they are government agencies and again, they do have their own public policies and rules. Uh, ultimately though, they do fall under the jurisdiction of the state. So if the governor says, hey, you must do this, um, they're, they're kind of stuck. But I do say that um, not to uh, keep you from speaking your mind. It is still imperative that we, the people, um, work through the process. We can get out there, we can assemble peacefully, we can make our um, minds known 
to our public officials, to our lawmakers, to whomever it is uh, that needs to listen and uh, speak our mind. Um, is super important and that's ultimately the goal of this show. I thank you for joining me on this. I hope it was informational. I hope it was a, a little bit fun and I'm looking forward to dialogue in the future. So ultimately I want to see that fire pull up in, uh, come out of you uh, for the political process. I hope you get out there, uh, know your rights, um, understand your freedoms, love your freedoms and make a difference. Let's do it together. Uh, thank you again for joining. Take care.